Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to the second, day, uh, second half of day one. Um, my name is Sun Feng Zhao. Uh, I'm the head of strategy and marketing intelligence at GWAC. Uh, it's my pleasure to host um, this session, um, trying to kick off uh, the same about building original offshore wind market in APAC. And this afternoon, when we talk about this session, we have two parts. The first part that's about the industrialization of offshore wind power supply chain and unlock the bottlenecks to enable scale and value. Uh, as we hear already um, from the opening session and also speakers um, coming from different parts of the world early today, and supply chain is crucial uh, in order to get the project installed uh, in the order. Um, so to get the project built, we need the in upfront investment um, from turbines to component, material, port, infrastructure, uh, et cetera. And uh, we split uh, decisions into two. And we're going to draw a global experience. Uh, we believe that which can be applied to the APAC region as well as highlight the different. So for the first session, uh, we got two speakers. Uh, I will be the first one to give the opening uh, remarks where I'm going to set up the setting about the global wind market and the uh, supply chain. Um, after my presentation, uh, we have a speaker join me and to talk about uh, how to accelerate the supply chain to meet the growth based on the uh, experience uh, they had. So um, now, before I kick off my presentation, I just want to highlight uh, uh, I guess probably yesterday, um, some of you already uh, at the uh, VIP uh, reception uh, at this stage, and we co-launched this uh, global offshore wind report. This is an annual report we produce uh, every summer. So uh, this report you can download um, directly. Uh, I think I have a slide um, with a barcode. Okay, this is my um, presentation. So the title is a, about the global stock tech, the offshore wind market and the supply chain. And the presentation in general, that's the, the key findings uh, from this report. Um, some of you are quite busy, um, but I hope in the next minute, uh, uh, we can quickly work through the key findings. Um, so yeah. This is the cover page for this uh, report. Uh, we used this uh, for lunch yesterday. So the key findings from this year's report uh, is very interesting. Uh, as many of you uh, are aware of that, you know, um, back in Europe, that's where I'm based, I'm, I'm based in Denmark. Um, also in North America, uh, you know, due to the financial challenge, the macroeconomic uh, situation and inflation, supply chain crunch, and for the developer, they're facing the increase, the capital cost. Um, even though we downgrade our forecast for the next five years between 2023 and 2027 by 17% for the combined capacity in Europe uh, and North America, but still, as you can see on this, the growth chart, we believe that double digital growth rate will maintain um, in the next 10 years. Um, the bar chart where we can see half, actually 49% of the global new addition in the next decade between 2023 and 2032 will come from APAC. Probably that's a good reason to justify why we are sitting here today and to have this uh, event. The market, uh, as the previous chart showed, are going to grow uh, significantly across the regions. And we believe that more record breaking are going to expect it start from 2025. The annual installation 
is likely to surpass the milestone of 30 gigawatt by 2022 and 50 gigawatt in 2030. Is this enough to bring us to meet the Paris climate change target? Unfortunately, no. If you take a look at the chart, the green bar show the annual installation we projected. Uh, that's a 52 gigawatt. But what we need in order to reach the 1.5 pathway, and we need to build annually, at the same time, 80 gigawatt. So that's why we believe that the total offshore wind installation and also new installation are going to be no uh, behind the schedule. However, if we look at the current situation, actually, many of you maybe will put a question mark on our forecast. Uh, I simply agree, because our outlook, just to be um, clear, is mainly based on the announced government target across global, and also the project pipeline, no matter fixed bottom project and floating wind project in different market. So if we take into account the supply chain situation in terms of nacelle, component, material, balance of plan, probably will end up different story or conclusion. So slide number three show, you know, the nacelle capacity we have today across the global. Uh, at this moment, 2023, in total globally, in terms of LASL, we only have 27.4 gigawatt. Next year, we expect further growth addition in Baltic Sea, in Poland, plus some expansion in Taiwan, but still this only give us 31.2 gigawatt of LASL capacity. If you take a look, the growth forecast at the table, a uh, property figures is really the small, but you can download the report. In general, uh, the red color just to tell you we're gonna have the trouble. So looking at the, the last cell capacity, uh, we expect bottlenecks in each single region apart from China. In Europe, right now, due to the relatively slow uh, deployment at this moment, so European turbine OEM can spare the capacity in emerging market, including the United States. But when the market passed the 10 gigawatt milestone in 2027, so we are going to be in the short of supply. So therefore, new investment need to be made in with, uh, in at once in order to support the growth. After we're looking at the LaSalle, let's take a look uh, the situation for vessels. Uh, in our global wind report, off your wind report, uh, we have the section looking at the vessels. So in general, the majority of the vessels uh, we identify are located in Europe and China. This is simply uh, tell the truth. You know, 99% of global offshore wind installed by the end of last year located in this two big market. Looking at the visual situation right now, we did the benchmark, demand and supply. We don't believe that there will be any shortage for vessels um, until 2026. However, as we said, Europe are going to pass the milestone of 10 gigawatt in 2026. So, you know, if we're looking at the further growth of the, this region, we believe that. Um, we're going to be in trouble in terms of vessel supply toward the end of this decade. So our projection is based on, you know, 14, 15 megawatt turbine will be used throughout the, this decade. But in reality is that some of the turbine OEM, as you know, are already working on the big turbine. So which means that we're probably end up with experience the bottlenecks uh, before the end of this decade. What does this mean for APAC regions? Because right now, uh, the installation is relatively slow in Europe, so the vessel operators, they can spare the vessels in APAC region, including Taiwan, Japan, South Korea. However, if the vessel operator have to sell the boat vessels back to Europe 
to support the growth at home. Market in APAC, they are going to, especially those market heavily rely on European vessels, they need to find a solution. And don't even mention that we still have some market in the APAC regions. Right now, we don't have any turbine installed in the water. So countries, including India, Philippines, Australia, and New Zealand, if those emerging markets want to get the turbine installed, they have to prepare and seeking the solution for vessels moving forward. Also, uh, our supply chain analysis found out a big challenge in the United States. At this moment, there's only one John Act compliant vessels under construction. So again, in general, in order to facilitate the installation for offshore and cross global, we need collaboration. Look at APAC regions. Uh, that could be an opportunity actually for emerging market to share the vessels with market where actually they have a spare capacity. Looking at the established market in APAC regions, we believe that China can still spare the vessels for Yilan because those two countries working together for the intertidal project uh, during the Indonesian rush. And the Japan, because the pipeline is relatively slim for the next five years, so they can spare some vessels. Uh, South Korea, the same, there are three, four vessels available. Uh, depends on what kind of you know, uh, floating installation method they are going to use. Probably there could be a chance uh, spare part can be shared from South Korea with the emerging market uh, in this region. That's the vessels. Now let's take a look at the uh, material. Those four bar charts uh, just to show the supply chain situation for material, uh, for steel plate, casting, and real earth material. Look at the steel plate, and more than half is coming from China. And casting, actually, China absolutely plays a dominant role. 76% of the casting is from China. And looking at real earth material, the dominant rules, it's even more obvious. So in terms of mining, 68% of the rare earth uh, material uh, from China. And take into account the processing, actually, uh, look at the situation in Q4 2022. This is statistics provided by our partner, uh, Benchmark Mining Renewable, based in London. 94% of the final refining um, rare earth material is from China. So again, uh, that's the situation we are having right now. We hear a lot of uh, conversation, specifically after, after Russia's invasion of Ukraine, including Europe, US, some other market are trying to build the supply chain security. There's nothing wrong with that because countries suffered from the delay and disruption during COVID, but again, before make this, you know, the decision, I think all the countries, industry need to work together and understand the true picture. We cannot simply decouple in China immediately because it's going to put the global energy transition under the risk. So based on the key findings, uh, we had some key takeaway from our global offshore wind supply chain study. By 2026, there may be supply chain bottlenecks in each region, apart from China. To address the bottleneck challenge, immediately investment will be needed to address those challenges and scale up the global supply chain. However, uh, the headwind faced by the wind industry today is uh, symptomatic of the policy and the challenging financial environment. Uh, as one speaker mentioned earlier today, before the lunch time, 3% of inflation is going to cost, 30% of increase in terms of uh, cost of energy for offshore, so significant impact. However, we don't see the current policy or financial environment fit the purpose in order to reach the 1.5 pathway. To get the project deployed 
across these regions, we also need to be careful in terms of restrictive trade and investment policy. As mentioned earlier, calls to decoupling from Chinese supply chain will absolutely slow the global offshore deployment, eventually delay the entire global energy transition. The final call is clear for each single one sitting here, no matter you're working for the industry, for the government, for the NGO, or national government. And to get the net zero target done, we need the partnership, collaborative effort between the industry and government, public and private, will be essential to address uh, the challenge. Those are the key findings um, from our report. Just to give you a little bit of flavor, uh, in addition to the offshore wind report, uh, we released um, action back home in Europe. Uh, we are working with the external partner doing a global supply chain deep dive. We are going to have more content included. Um, material, balance of plan, also port. So if you are looking at the key findings, uh, you may find out that we're going to launch this report uh, during the COP28. Please start turn on that. That's my um, presentation um, for now. Thank you. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, my job for this session is to kick the star of the conversation, just to show the global picture about the market growth and also the supply chain. And we, we see a huge challenge in terms of bottlenecks. The only region we mentioned do not have the challenge, that's the, uh, the Chinese market. Um, but how quickly you know, the industry can work in together and to build up the supply chain to reach the scale. And now we, you know, today we got the opportunity um, to get one speaker um, from one of the key component supplier uh, in China. As you know, China is the largest market in terms of onshore wind, offshore wind, and renewable in general. Look at the wind alone, the market has been through the global, uh, the, the op onshore and offshore wind installation rush. In a single year, they can build more than 50 gigawatts. So that's a skill we need in order to reach the net zero target. So now please allow me to introduce the next speaker, uh, Mr. Peng Chao Cai, the vice president and chairman of Sangro. Um, he's also the chairman of uh, uh, Sangro Hydrogen. So Mr. Peng uh, graduated from Shanghai University with a master's degree. So, Mr. Peng has been leading the team uh, in working on technology innovation, uh, integrate the development of wind power and hydrogen energy in multiple fields. And under his leadership, uh, Sangro has achieved many te technical breakthroughs in both wind and hydrogen sector. And uh, I could tell you, uh, hydrogen, uh, in terms of uh, wind power converter, Sangro is already the number one in the world. Many of you are aware of that. Sangro is a leading solar emitter producer. Actually, they are strong in the wind supply chain as well. And also, in terms of hydrogen, uh, they are one of the top three hydrogen system supplier as well. So, please now give the state. I'm going to give the state to Mr. Pan, and uh, I'm looking forward, like some of you sitting here to hear the lesson learned from Sangro. Now this stage is yours, Mr. Pen. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Peng Chao Cai. It's my honor to have the chance to make a speak here. I come from China Sangro, working as a Sangro VP in charge of wind and hydrogen business. The topic of my presentation 
is getting the global offshore wind and hydrogen supply chain into gear. Thanks, Mr. Zhao Feng, stated the supply chain challenges and opportunities in offshore wind and hydrogen. How does Sengro seize the chance to make business breakthroughs? About uh, Sengro, founded in 1997, Sengro is one of top 100 new energy enterprises in the world and a member of Global RE100 Great Initiative. Sengro's main business is solar energy storage, storage wind converters, renewable hydrogen systems, and other business in the slide. In general, Sengro is integrate renewable solutions, uh, integrate renewable solution company, commit to bring clean power for all. This is Sengro's strength. Today, we show details about uh, supply chain and uh, lean manufacturing. In terms of sustainable, in terms of sustainable supply chain, Sengro takes advantage of skills, skill, and has reached strategic cooperation with many well-known suppliers in the world. Sagrowind was founded in 2004. The main products are wind converter, wind pitch control, and wind aftermarket solutions. Last year, global shipment of wind converter exceeded 23 gigawatt. It's worth mentioning that our converter products have achieved an average annual cost reduction of 9% over the past five years. In terms of lean manufacturing, Sengro implement flexible manufacturing, digital factory, and uh, reliable quality. We increase the wind converter output voltage, support, support customer reduce WTD cost successfully, which now becomes mainstream product in China wind market. Based on sectoral experience, the bottlenecks in the industry, in the industry supply chain can indeed be overcome. On one hand, this can be achieved through economics of skill, and uh, on the other hand, through te technological innovation. Now, single hydrogen. Sengro Hydrogen started in 2016. In 2021, we launched 
PEM and uh, ALK products. In 2022, one gigawatt manufacturing plant put into operation. During this uh, period, we are carrying out uh, technological innovation and uh, product iter iteration of the time. And now, in the end of this year, our production capacity will be a massive expansion to three gigawatt. We are the first in industry to propose flexible hydrogen production technology, which can achieve the flexible integration of hydrogen production system with the PV, wind, ESS, grid, and other multiple energy sources. Different with other suppliers, we can provide integrated flexible green hydrogen production system including ALK and PAM electrolyzer, IGBT hydrogen production power supply, gas liquid, gas, gas liquid separation and purification equipment, intelligent hydrogen management system, To support uh, rapid product innovation and uh, scale manufacturing, we built the largest test pla platform in China with 4,000 cubic meter per hour. The test platform has a full range of testing and verification ability from core materials, key equipment, to electricity, hydrogen, coupling systems. Furthermore, through the introduction of IPD product development mode, we established our own design simulation and test verification abilities to ensure that product have long-term technological advancement. Also, our products have obtained a number of international certifications. Single wind and hydrogen projects span, in, span the global Wind converter, totally supplement, total supplement, 62 gigawatt. Hydrogen equipment, total order, 40,000 cubic meter hour. Phasing global, single of the best wind power and uh, gray hydrogen solutions contribute to global zero carbon development above in my presentation. Thanks for your listening. Thank you, Mr. Pen. So thank you, Mr. Pen, to give us an overview about you know, the experience that how Sangro has quickly wrapped up. Uh, there's one slide we can see just within two years, the annual production for power converter increased from three gigawatt into 23 gigawatt. That's a nearly 10 fold of growth. And also um, innovation, that's what I heard. 
the keyword in terms of how do you wrap up and bring down the cost of the uh, solution. And in the end, I think Sangro has, has this uh, in-house test system to ensure the quality. Uh, as an industry, uh, we need to make sure that we deliver the, the volume and, of course, also the quality to support the sustainable growth of the uh, industry. So that's the first part of this uh, optimization. Now I'm going to hand it over to my colleague, Li Ming. Thank you.